We, uh, I've been reading a lot because of the feast coming up on the Bride of Christ. And, the, and the, as I read those and um, realize the gravity of doing Christian versus being Christian. Yeah. And we can, we know the ropes so well, we can lapse into going through the hoops versus a genuine, close relationship with Christ. And I was thinking about, and I know the students are going to teach, and I'll give them enough time. But I was thinking about when Robert and I got together, and the Lord was doing such a work with our friends. And we, if we weren't in church, we were all together reading and praying and casting out demons and eating together and just being consumed with the idea of staying close to the Lord. And even now, there's different musicians that have come along over the years, like Ruth Fazel. I love her, the one that wrote, um, Who is this? Who is this? Coming out of the wilderness. That's another one that would be a good song for the feast, that particular song of, It's your church. It's your church. It's your bride. It's your bride. You know? And the, the, the songs that spoke of being lovesick used to, and still as I speak of those songs or even allude to those songs, the inside of me has such a longing. And sometimes, you know, the Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. And the enemy is so busy trying to get us in situations where something we hoped for, like you want all your children to serve the Lord. And when one of your kids goes astray, there's a hope deferred going on. And there's a heart sick going on. It's not God's fault, but there's just kind of a feeling of licking our own wounds and that ability to truly mean. And that song stuck out to me when I was at Bethel. Though none go with me, still I will follow. To mean that with all of our heart. To be a Daniel. Everybody else is bowing down to that image. I'm not going to do it no matter what. No matter what. Everybody else is obeying the don't pray. I'm going to do it the same way I always have. Right by the window, the whole neighborhood can hear me. I want to lift up the Lord. That passion. There's a movie Robert and I just saw. It's called Mama Heidi. And we might show it in church um, soon. It's a story of Heidi and Roland Baker and their call to Mozambique and what they went through. Um, and it just, it's the kind of thing that puts all together, the kind of thing I'm talking about right now, being so crazy in love with, with Jesus. She talks of a time that she was just tired. They were going out in the street picking up orphans. They, they kept taking them to their, their place. They had babies with AIDS that had like a two-year, if they didn't get a miracle, two-year time clock on their lives. That's what they were told. That's how long they probably last. And just work and so had to work to get recognition and licensing for their clinic. Just somebody gave them some property, but it was just, nobody wanted that property. It, it was just a big fat mess. But they're like, it's perfect. We'll take it. Just the whole concept of you know, you get shot at. They didn't want them there. One of the guys, she had her arm around him, a young guy, maybe, I'm guessing 18 or so. And when she first went on the street, he tried to kill her. Who's this white lady coming here? She said, Americans don't last long there. They're not real thrilled with us in Mozambique. And just that whole concept of... I am willing to do whatever the Lord wants me to do. And everything the world holds dear and will use to judge my um, value, I, I don't care. If the Lord doesn't value it, it doesn't matter to me. If the Lord isn't into, that's how he judges my value. You know, it's, now I will say, and she always looks nice. She always looks nice. And I think sometimes when we approach people, how we look, because of where people's level is, because of earth, flesh, to get an entree sometime 
We don't need to stink. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't need to look like we just crawled out of bed and don't care how we look. You know what I mean? There is some, but that's not our value system. Even though we become all things to all men so we can win some, and that's part of it, that's part of it. The fact is, the whole point is, Lord, I just want to be a fisher of man like you said to be. I want to have communion with you. I want your word to open up to me more and more. I want to be your light. The theme of the feast this year is about uh, the bride being prepared. That skit we're going to do is about the ten virgins. Just the, And the oil is to, if you got oil, I was just thinking another way to judge people. And yes, we're supposed to judge them by their fruits. See whether or not you're shining. If you're shining for Jesus, you got oil in your lamp. If you don't have oil in your lamp, you're light and then either, you know, if you got a tiny bit, it's either dimmed or on its way out. When you walk in a room, do you shine for Jesus? Do you shine? And you know people who shine, and you know people, and people get hurt. And somebody brought out the phrase, burnout can be real. But it was the first time I had this, because I've never been burned out. I've been sad. I've had to be in warfare. But to say, I need, I'm just burned out. I can say I'm done for the day. You know what that feels like. You're done. You're just done. You know, you're, you're spent as far as your energy. But to say I'm burned out, I don't even want to do what I'm called to do right now. I'm burned out. I, it's the first time today that it dawned on me, maybe that's actually spiritually saying, I didn't keep up the oil supply. My lamp burned out. My energy burned out. Now, that does not mean I'm not sympathetic towards physical struggles. Like you're in your fourth realm of, of chemo. That's an extreme, but, you know, and you're just discouraged. You know, I mean, we don't want to be cold about what the state of our body can do to the state of our motivational push. You know what I'm saying? I, when I speak, don't think of all the exceptions like I do. Think about the general rule of if I'm burned out, why didn't I keep my own oil supply? What am I lacking? I went to Cal Bergson one time for counsel about I was having a migraine. I've had maybe four in my life. It's not been a repetitive, normal thing, but I've had some. I know what it feels like. It's excruciating. And he said to me, you're giving out more than you're taking in. Spiritually, you're giving out more than you're taking in. He got a word from the Lord. It wasn't like he's a doctor that diagnosed. He got a word from the Lord. You're giving out more than what you're taking in. You can't handle that. You have to take in and then give out. Take in and then replenish the oil. Replenish The oil is replenished. Well, that's another thing. That's a whole other lesson. Uh, you know, this... Hearing the word of God, praying for each other, get, having our quiet times with the Lord. I mean, there's lists and lists of how we keep, you know, praying in the Holy Ghost, praying in tongues. Oh, I spoke in tongues once. No, 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 you pray. Paul said, I do it way much. I mean, there's a whole list of how do we keep that oil going on. And what are the enemies of the oil going on? What are the enemies? What are the enemies of that? Nobody can serve two masters. And a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Robert and I just went through a period of time. Well, behind the... Cordell and I working on the computer so long to get the Wi-Fi back. Then we... Our dishwasher stopped. And it was... We, we waited probably eight months before we even, we just got another one. Well, in the process of getting another one, you find out this valve needs changing. And by the way, the toilet in your bathroom is, we're talking plumber talk, is running all the time. You should replace the toilet. And by the way, and by the way, and by the way, <laughs> guy comes in to install the dishwasher, can't do it until that valve is switched up from the copper one to some other parts. Plumber for that, and then these people for this, and huh? The little sink, too. It's just, ah. Uh. 
you know, you say, I want this, and all of a sudden there's 10 other things. And with those 10 other things, I made up that number 10. Um, service master had to come twice. Home Depot sent. Plumbers had to come twice. One day they were supposed to come. I went about on all our errands because Robert had to stay home the whole day to wait on the guy who never came. Why am I saying that? Because rather than letting things like that distract us from getting the oil replenished, which it does, we need to say, attack, attack, attack. Respond with getting the oil. Make sure that oil supply is, is good. And there was a point at which uh, the service professor dudes were there. Nick and Travis. Travis was six foot what? Eight. Eight, 20 years old, just a yeah, little darling. And I just felt a burden for them both. And I said, do both of you know what it means to be saved? No, they didn't go to church. No, well, I was Catholic and I was confirmed. I said, well, you might still not know me. So I said, you want to hear it? Because I don't want you to leave knowing that and not share with you. Yep, they wanted to hear it. So I had a chance for, what, 20 minutes? For a dialogue to share what that meant. And I thank the Lord for that, because if I would have been frustrated with the whole plumbing situation, think, well, that's one box, and this Jesus thing is another box. You know what I'm saying? Instead of thinking, well, they're in my house for a reason. Amen. You understand? So I'm saying, God help us to keep our main purpose in life, to grow up into Christ, to shine for him, to glorify the Father, to love one another, love our neighbors. Help us to keep that in mind, no matter how frustrated. See, it's the same thing as with Cordell. Be nice. I didn't even call anybody up and say, what do people do if they take a day off from their job and stay home all day and wait on one of y'all and you don't show up? I mean, I could have went off on these people. Right? But why is this happening? What am I supposed to learn? How can I become more full of the oil of the Holy Ghost? So I'm just saying to you, this whole theme is really touching my heart of just growing up into him and being what I'm supposed to be. Give me oil in, in my, my lamp. lamp. Keep See, me burning. He's singing our song. <laughs> Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give, Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning, keep me burning, keep me burning till the break of day. Oh, give me all in my lamp. Keep me burning, give me all in my lamp. I pray, give me all in my lamp. Keep me burning, keep me burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. Okay, now we have just enough time to have Hannah and Jacob and Dylan and Rebecca. Amen. Amen. Good morning. So deity of Christ is what we've been studying this month. And a lot of the things we've learned about and heard about as we're listening to the teachings is how we relate to others yeah. in response to, to the truth of Christ being God. And um, Peter, 1 Peter 3.15 says, but sanctify your heart, sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts. Be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason for the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. And it takes wisdom for us to know when to not bid someone Godspeed, as we, that was discussed earlier this month, and when to share the hope that lies within you. Right. Um, and the Lord, you know, I believe the Lord can give us that wisdom. If we're close to him, we'll be able to see when something is an open door that he's telling us to walk through. Like Rosemary, with the, with the plumbers coming in her home, I'm sure the, the Holy Spirit gave her, um, gave her that open door. The Lord gave that to her. Um, 
And then we also have the life of Jesus as an example for us. You know, how and to whom and when did he share about who he was? I was thinking, too, about the people who were rejecting that truth and who called him a blasphemer, you know, the Pharisees, the scribes. Those were the people who also wanted him persecuted with, without a fair trial. And so we don't necessarily want to be friendly to that crowd. You know, we don't want to look like we're a part of that crowd. Right. So, you know, what I'm realizing is that there's nothing unloving about saying no to someone or closing a door yeah, yeah. when um, someone's trying to lead you away from, from our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So, um, and then another thing that I'm remembering is to hold on to the faith that we have. You know, the study of the deity of Christ is, is it could go on forever, it's, and it can be right. mentally right. draining, too, at times. Yeah. But even if our understanding is not totally full, you know, if we're, if we're still seeking to understand fully, we can hold on to what we know, um, what we've been taught, what the Lord has revealed to us in his word. Um, in 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, yes. for he cannot deny himself. Right. So he's going to be, who he is is true, no matter what anyone else That's professes. Right. Right. Um, and in another verse, 2 Corinthians, also 2.13, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual as we strive to learn. Um, sorry, with spiritual. Um, so when we're looking for understanding in certain things, we have to, I mean, we don't stop seeking uh, to understand and learn, um, but we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit when we're doing that too, because you know, other people won't understand if they don't have that. Um, you know, and I've also realized that I have a lot to learn when it comes to the subject. We all have a lot to learn, I'm sure. Last night, Dylan and I were kind of quizzing each other, preparing for uh, the test that we, or the quiz that we've got today in the school. And so we were reading some of the verses that Rosemary had prepared um, on the study sheet. And, you know, there was some, I was struggling some, and Dylan was saying, you know, you know this, you know. And uh, I was... I know some of it, um, but it's a lot of it's scrambled. You know, the timelines are off with what I thought was in certain verses. Um, I don't always have the right context, and I realize I need to do, you know, maybe a little more studying of the history yes. of what's happened, what's happening now, and the things that are in the future that are prophesied. So, you know, even there was one new insight I, I got last night in Isaiah 40. 10 and 11, it says that the Lord is coming with a strong hand and his arm, what is it? Yes. His arm shall rule for him. Yes. And I don't know, for some reason that picture stuck with me, with a strong hand and his arm ruling. You know, there's other verses that talk about the scepter being on his right. Yes. And it's just a very clear picture of Christ being a ruler. Yes. And you know, why would why would Christ be ruling at the time of his return if he wasn't sovereign? And how would he return if he himself wasn't, wasn't divine and the giver of, of life to us? So I guess I want to encourage all of you as you're studying about this, hearing about it, learning about it, to hold on to what you know already. Be firm in it. Um, don't back down. But also strive to know more. And... Keep seeking revelation and look for those pictures. Like I received a picture of Christ being a ruler. Look for those things that you can hold on to in your heart, in your mind, and use as a witness. Um, because as you get more and more of those pictures, it just it becomes undeniable. And um, so, so don't don't stop learning and growing. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So in studying the deity of Christ, Hannah just mentioned one of the things she saw was that he'll be a ruler. And I want to tell you a story 
about some guys, a group of guys, who read about Christ being a ruler and did something about it. Uh, these guys, I'll first share with you the verse that they read. It was in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. It says, But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, but from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. King James says, from everlasting. Not in everlasting, we think in the sense of from now on, but this is from everlasting. So also in the other direction, from everlasting. And there was a group of guys who read this on a scroll, and I'm imagining one of them pointed it out and said, hey, guys, check, take a look at this. Take a look at this. It says in Bethlehem, there's going to be someone who comes forth who is an eternal being. Now, I don't know how much of the scriptures of the Old Testament maybe these guys had. I'll, you'll see who they are in a minute, but they, some of you may have guessed already. Yes. But I don't know what other scriptures they had, but this alone tells them that out of Bethlehem will come someone who existed before the universe was. Before he spent an eternity with himself before time began. And he'll be in Bethlehem. I imagine one of the guys is like more excited, like, come on, take a look at this. It's going to be in Bethlehem. That's just a few days journey away. We could be there. We could see him face to face. And then one of the guys might be skeptical, I imagine, and he says, well, if there was this eternal cosmic being and if he was to reveal himself, why would he pick Bethlehem? Well, I don't know, but if that's what it says. That's what it says where he'll be. We got to be there. And we can, we can, well, if we want to be there, if he's eternal and powerful, we want to get on his good side, we should bring gifts. And so that's what they did. They figured out, I don't know how they did, but when they read the stars or they saw in this, his star that God sent them and knew that it was time to go to Bethlehem, and they made the journey. And it says in Matthew chapter 2, verse 5, uh, I think I'll start in verse 4, actually. Uh, they showed up in Bethlehem, and maybe they were looking for directions because they asked the king, and they asked him, have you seen it? We saw his star. Uh, it says in this scroll of Micah that he'll be in Bethlehem, and we're here. Do you know about this? And King Herod said, um, someone who's going to be king of the Jews, king of Israel. Uh, well, you, I, I don't know where he is, but you tell me where he is when you find him, because I would love to yeah. worship him. I would love to worship him. Uh, and so then they didn't know where to go, but then all of a sudden the star started moving. It went over and it stopped in front of a house. Now, I don't know about you, but when I see stars, if one of the stars is above a house, you just take three steps to the left and it's above a different house. Yeah. So this was a supernatural star that had settled over the house. Um, and when they did see it settle over the house, um, where's the verse that says, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. There it is in 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. They were excited. Imagine this entire journey, this day's journey they were making, looking at each other like, we're going to see the eternal one. We're going to see him in real life here on earth. Wow. Whew. Can you imagine it? How excited they were. And they rejoiced. And then they, they did see him in the house, just this little baby boy. And they gave him gifts. Maybe one of them played the drums. Who knows? Uh, but they got to see the eternal one face to face in person. And they made several days journey to do it. And they did it. God showed them where to go. And I want to encourage all of us, the eternal one, the whole reason that Jesus came to earth was to make it so that we can have communication with him. Right. We don't have to make a day's journey or several days journey. We can talk to him. The veil was torn and we have access to that. We can commune with him. We can bless him with worship and praise. We can bless him just like the wise men blessed Jesus and with his family. When We should rejoice with exceeding great joy that we even have this opportunity. So I want to encourage you uh, to take advantage of that uh, open door that God has made for each and every one of us to come before him and to even see the eternal one face to face. All right, good morning. So I'm also going to teach on the deity of Christ, obviously. Uh -huh. 
And uh, I wanted to start, because this is a very broad topic, so these are one of my least favorite ones to create an open pulpit for, because there's no boundaries. Clear boundaries are easier for me to create an open pulpit, but hopefully the Lord gave me something, you know. Whenever I come to church, Robert, and I, Robert knows I'm preaching, he always says, give me heaven. So, give me heaven today. So I, hopefully that's what the Lord's doing today with me, but... I want to start, the first thing I thought of when we're thinking and we're talking about the deity of Christ, because Jesus does have a throne, but it's not the same throne as God's. And we can see it as, um, in Hebrews 8.1, it says, we have such a high priest, who's Jesus, who is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So he gets his own throne. He is God, but he also has his own throne to enjoy next to God, ruling together. And then in Daniel 7, uh, this is verses 13 through 14. It explains what this throne is for. Because if you're going to have a throne, it means nothing unless you have a kingdom to rule. It's just a chair. But that's not what his throne is. It's a kingdom ruling chair. And it says in these verses, it towards the, I think it starts in 14. And he, there he was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, which just as Jacob pointed out, everlasting which shall not pass away in his kingdom that shall not be destroyed. So his kingdom is, where is it? Over people and nations. It's of the earth. He's the king of the earth. And when I first read that, or when I was thinking about it these past couple of days to prepare for this, it made me think about who else was given a kingdom over the earth or a rule over the earth. And if any of you don't know, it's Genesis. All the way back in Genesis, God told his first creation Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our image of our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing and every creepeth upon the earth. So why is that throne available? Well, because they messed up. And how'd they mess up? What is the difference between Adam and Eve who were man and Jesus was man? And that's the to point out the deity of Christ to me is to find out what that difference was. And the truth is, the truth is, Jesus didn't know sin. Yes. Every man is son, Adam and Eve is son, sinned, but Jesus didn't sin. So that right there to me really points the deity out because if there's only one person in this entire earth who had flesh and didn't sin, it must be God. <laughs> yes. How is it not? How has no one else been able to accomplish that if Jesus wasn't that special person? And he was the person that needed to come so that we can even have that hope. You know, one of the reasons Jesus is given this dominion and authority is what did he do? He crushed the serpent. And what did Adam and Eve do? They did the exact opposite. They gave in to the serpent. And why did they give in to the serpent? The serpent tricked, not tri he lied to them and, and said, if you eat this fruit, you will be like God. So that's what they wanted to be. They already had a kingdom and dominion. They already were like God in image and had rule. But what did they want? They wanted more. And mo now let's compare that to Jesus. He was given a kingdom. He was promised a kingdom. He knew about it. The Lord said, you're going to be ruler over the earth. Instead of taking it for himself, if we want to be like God, the trick isn't to eat an apple or to think for ourselves. It's to do what God wants. Yeah. And that's what Jesus did. That is the true ability to be a God isn't what you look like, because we all have the images of God. is isn't what you look like. It's are you doing what God said? Yeah. It's very simple, but the world wants to tell you it's, a trick. You have to, oh, eat this apple. Oh, do this. Do that. And it's not just about things you do. It's that heart condition. Is Are you trying to serve God yeah. or be your own God? That's right. That's the key. And I was thinking about, you know, they always use these images of beasts as the person Jesus conquers. And that's all of us. We're a creation. And when we choose to live in that flesh, we are beasts. We're beautiful. John's a handsome man. We have a bunch of beautiful people here. But man, can we be ugly? We can do a bunch of ugly things. Right. We can be horrible to each other. We can be good, but man, can we be horrible. I have a cat at home who's very beautiful, very handsome boy, and he looks so peaceful when he's sleeping. And the other day when I went in my basement, there was a bunny without a head. Oh. Not so sweet, because he's an animal. And we can be that if we don't let the... Jesus didn't let the beast conquer his life. We have to not let that serpent tell us how to live our life, because if we do, we'll give into it, and we'll be just like that. We'll destroy people. We'll ruin their lives. But if we do the opposite, we let Jesus have his spirit rule our life, just as it says, we'll inherit the kingdom as well. 
He's our leader, but he'll, it's our kingdom too. We're going to bask in it. We're going to enjoy it, just like Adam and Eve were going to be able to before they lost that. Yeah. The last thing I was telling Hannah last night when I was thinking about what to share, I was just this picture of, you know, God planted these people to be the kings of the earth. And they, they were told what, what to do. They had the knowledge, but they didn't do it. But now we, when we get to that place that they were in, this new glorified earth, we're going to have a king who knows what we went through as a human, knows our flesh, knows our struggles, and we can trust him. They should have trusted God, but they didn't. But maybe it's, it's just so beautiful that now we're going to have that king there that knows us, knows our troubles, and we can fully trust him when we get to that place. And we need to trust him now because while the enemy wants to tell us he has power over our life with death, Jesus showed that death has no power over him, and that's why he won. If we choose to let the serpent tell us he has power over us, then we'll lose. Yeah. So we got to just keep fighting the faith, fight of faith, and trust in him, and serve him only. Yeah. All right. Good morning. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm going to start in Genesis, where uh, Dylan started, because he gave a good example. In the beginning, God, when he created man, um, he said, I'm going to, he said, let us create him in our own image. So even in the beginning, God showed the nature that he had. There was more. There was not just God, but there was us. There was more than one involved. Um, so as we read in Genesis, he also said, when he started off with, we're going to create the beast, we're going to create the man, and we're going to create man in our image. He said um, in chapter 3, he did, um, after Adam and Eve sinned against him, and they broke that connection with them and God. He prophesied his coming back. He said, I'm going to put enmity between the yeah. snake and man. And he prophesied right there the coming of Christ. And also, you can see a picture of Christ, even though it wasn't, um, he didn't, wasn't born in the flesh at that point, of the difference between where God was and where Christ was or his son was, because he was referred to as the son of man n numerous times in the Old Testament. You, um, when the Lord met with Abraham, he sat with him, and he had a conversation with him. If you look in Moses, when God went and met with Moses, he said, you can't even look upon my face. So the difference where you can see the son of God in the Old Testament was he was able to literally sit and we have that communion with man where God, the Father, you can't even look upon his face. Yet it'd kill you. Then um, slowly as you go into when Christ was born, there are so many pictures in the New Testament of how he had the power and authority God gave him. He had the ability to give life. God, when he created man, he breathed life into him. The only one in the Old Testament that was able to give life was God. And then when Christ came, he was able to give life to the, um, to the child who was born or who died. And her, his parents came in and they're like, my daughter's dying. He got there. Everybody was mourning this child. They knew she was predicted dead. Christ went inside, and that little girl walked again because he gave her life. That was a picture of what God is able to do. If Christ was not God, he would not have had that power or authority to be able to give life because only God is able to give life. And now, because Christ lives in us, we have his power that is able to give life. But they didn't have that power back then because even though they did, again, have the Holy Spirit, which is the other Godhead, the Holy Spirit would come upon them. He never resided there. Now we have the Holy Spirit who lives in us, and we're able to have that third person, the Spirit of God and the Father, inside of us. So that picture of the three that are in, in Christ is right there. In the Old Testament, it said the Spirit of God hovered the earth in Genesis. Right there, another picture of from the beginning, the Spirit of God was always there. So if you look, even from the beginning, God has never made anything a secret. He's always put the picture throughout the word. And you can see the fingerprint of the Spirit of God, the Son of God, and God the Father all the way through the book. 
So all you have to do is look forward. So the deity is, is written right in front of us. Christ is the Son of God. You cannot deny it through the power and authority that he was given. He was born of a virgin birth that was prophesied. God showed you the picture back in the Old Testament, the prophecy of his, his son. And so we all know that you cannot have a child unless there's two people involved there. But God is able, once again, to give life. And he gave his life to a baby that we would all be saved. So. Jesus is on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus is on the inside. Keeps working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Every day I've got Jesus on the inside. Keeps working the outside. And oh, what a change in my life. My life. Oh, what a a change taking place in my in my life oh and it's little by little but every way little by little in every way my g he's changing me how does that happen as i look upon his face Jesus is changing me by his grace. My Jesus keeps changing me. Yes, he is. He's changing me. Glory, glory. Oh, glory, No, no, I'm not that same old person I used to be. Oh, glory, glory. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, for my Jesus is changing 